Hello everybody and welcome to the panel on uh, EU and UK ingredients laws updates. I'm Julia Ray, I'm editor of Cosmetics Business and I'll be your moderator for the next hour. And uh, it is my huge pleasure to introduce our experts for this topic. Uh, so we have uh, next to me Olivia Santoni from Bloom Regulatory. Uh, we have um, Alex Fotheringham from MSL Solution Providers and Sarah Jane Dobson from Kennedy's Law. Uh, great to have you here, guys. Uh, so to begin, uh, maybe if you could introduce yourselves, uh, your companies and your involvement with uh, European cosmetics legislation. Let's start with you next to me. Great. <laughs> so I'm Olivia Santoni. I'm the CEO of Bloom Regulatory. We are a consultancy company based in London and we offer any type of, I would say, pragmatic regulatory advice. We've been quite busy following the Brexit situation and pro uh, working a lot on uh, ingredients, of course, but uh, mainly on claim support for efficacy. Um, I'm Alex Fotheringham. I'm the operati operations director of MSL. We're a third party responsible person, so we act as RP in the European Union from our Irish company and the UK from our UK company. Um, we have a safety assessment team and a test in laboratory as well. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Jane Dobson. I'm a partner at Kennedy's law firm. Um, we are specialists in product law, so we have a team of about 45 people that are based in London and then 70 officers across the world that deal with product law issues across the life cycle. In particular, one of the sectors we focus on is cosmetics, so lovely to be here today. Wonderful, and it's uh, great to have you here today as well. Uh, now, as a starting point, uh, perhaps it would be helpful uh, to really focus on the EU cosmetic products regulation and uh, possibly to provide a run through of what 2022 has looked like regarding updates, uh, both so far and upcoming. So again, Olivia, not just because you're sitting next to me, <laughs> but um, could you talk us uh, through uh, what the changes have been? Exactly. So uh, as you know, when it comes to the European regulations, so the regulation stays static, but of course we have a lot of adaptation, technical progress, um, legislation coming into force, and we expect around six to eight changes every year. So of course it has been quite busy. Here today, I think it is important that we go to some of the main ingredients and main changes, but also to explain how it works with the UK. I think a lot of you are interested to see, well, is there any divergence with the UK when it comes to something that has changed in the EU? or are we on the same rule? And uh, there is, uh, there are some divergence, I have to be honest with you, mainly when it's come to timing. Okay, as you know, before Brexit, we have adapted the regulation, so we are exactly under the same annexes, but the catch up take a little bit more time, which doesn't mean the products are unsafe, it's just that we have some time, a little bit more time to go to some of the uh, changes. So we had some changes when it's come to entry of specific restrictions for titanium dioxide, for instance, in Europe that came into force. Again, it's applied from 1st October 2021. So it was before we implemented all of the Brexit scenario. So at the moment, uh, we are still uh, under the preview situation and in Europe, in the UK. Huh? We have uh, also some uh, new restrictions for salicylic acid when it's come to restriction and labeling in Europe that came into force uh, on the 17th of June 2021. Here we are uh, for certain part of this restriction looking more to a deadline in the UK of the 15 December 2022. So you can see this lapse of time that is a bit different with some of the making available deadline more toward March 2023. So again, if you're working toward the EU, you will still be able to place your product on the market in Europe. You may have a little bit more time to distribute some of your product in Europe. Similar situation with tetrahydropyranoxylphenol, a DHA restriction as well. Um, we have some uh, entry in Annex 2 as well with the Lilial, as we know. So this has been, I would say, hein, some of the key issue for the industry mm -hmm. because it's, it's part of your fragrance, unfortunately. So it was not sometimes easy to identify in your formula. You really had to go through uh, your formulation. And this applied uh, from 1st March 2022. This has, um, uh, I would say, uh, really um, increased reformulation, unfortunately, in the industry. Uh, but the marketing deadline in the UK is a little bit longer. So I think, again, keep in mind, if you have a supply chain that allow to bring some product in the UK, placing on the market deadline is 15 October 2022, so a little bit more timing, little month, and making available is 15, 12, 
2022. Important the deadline for making available because this is really toward where your distributor are really looking to because after this date they won't be able to keep this product on their shelves. Uh, methoxyethyl acrylate as well, similar ban, again different date in the UK with a bit more time. We had uh, some restriction for sodium hydroxymethyl glycinate. Uh, zinc peritium, again if you are looking into the air care category there has been also some uh, restriction with prohibition in Annex 2 that's coming into force on 1st March 2022. And again, you will see the same deadline in the UK. So everything that was toward 1st March 2022 in Europe, we are expecting that to enter into force 15 October 2022 in the UK for the first deadline and the making available deadline 15 December 2022. So it's not that much, but it gives you a little bit of, uh, of aspect. We have the methyl N methyl anotrinolinate as well. We have the fifth CMR omnibus. As you know, there was a big issue because before the cosmetic regulation was quite simple. You were looking at Annex 2 and you knew what was banned. Of course, there is not a lot of link with the classification, labeling and packaging. Um, um, legislation and therefore there is sometimes uh, new classification that happen in this legislation that are therefore implemented via an omnibus in the cosmetic regulation. We are also awaiting on the same type on the CAP the 6 CMR omnibus so again so really looking at the, the, the CMR uh, classification. We had some benzophenone tree and octicrylane new annex uh, six restriction. So for your sunscreen, very important to look into that as well. And we have some specific labeling requirement for formaldehyde releasing preservatives. So again, this we have more time because it will apply from 31st July 2026. But again, as you can see, always important to follow what's happening at the EU level. Then, of course, we need to check if it's applied immediately or with a little bit more time in the UK, but uh, it's uh, in constant evolution. So I think it's good every year to do a little round up. Yeah. Very quick, I could spend the day, but <laughs> I think we've done a little tour. Well, thank, thank you so much, Olivia. I hope you guys were taking notes because that is a lot of changes. So um, so from a kind of implementation point of view for, for companies, uh, what do these mean? What are going to be the most difficult? I mean, what do these mean for, for all of your clients? Um, well, the change to Lilial was the big change from a formulation point of view because it was in almost all the fragrances, so that that re involved a huge mm -hmm. reformulation. I think with that one, we saw it's actually been useful having the UK lagging behind in terms of implementation date because it's given brands a market to utilise those products and to take advantage of having the October and December deadlines later. So people have moved product from the EU into the UK market to use up stock rather than having to destroy it, um, which is really useful. Um, the UK dates are interesting in that we're only running a two month between placing on the market and making available, which is very unusual. We would normally see six months plus for those kind of things. So they're obviously taking into account that those bans have come into force in the EU earlier. They're expecting you to have been aware of it and prepared as you would if it w we were still part of the EU. My hope is that UK bans going forward will follow a more traditional EU mm. stance and we'll see a longer deadline between those because two months is kind of, it's not enough time for that to make any difference. You might as well just do a making available ban um, in October if you're going to run it like that. Um, and I think the formaldehyde change is probably the really big one mm -hmm. um, because it's not something that we've really been looking at previously. So those formaldehyde releases and the percentage of formaldehyde in the finished product um, across all of those formaldehyde releases is a big change, something that needs to be considered, is a new test that people need to mm -hmm. consider. Um, so that that's probably the most significant change because it's completely different to just a ban on an ingredient, which you know mm -hmm. from your formulation. This requires additional consideration from a chemistry point of view and potentially testing for it as well. Fantastic. And uh, Sarah, would you say there's been similar feedback from uh, Kennedy's clients as well? Yeah, absolutely. I guess from a legal perspective, the most prominent difference is obviously we've got different regulators that are focused on different things. Um, 
from our perspective as working across sectors, I would say that the cosmetics industry is probably best placed and it tends to be the, the clients that are best placed to tracking and knowing all of these legislative developments for the reason that Olivia said that mm. this is a very common occurrence. But keeping up with that um, lag with between the UK and the EU does prove to be a particular issue. And having in mind the different leverage and the different sort of levers of interest for different regulators is something that we're seeing mm. more and more. Mm. And it's important to keep in mind that now we have the OPSS slash the, the trading standards in the UK on top of any other regulators you might have been dealing with in the rest of Europe um, who are focused on enforcement of their regulations and, and will make sure that that is something mm -hmm. they keep an eye on specifically. Yeah. Fantastic. What, what's interesting mm. about the ones that are coming up are these don't have any plans in the UK at the moment. So all the previous ones, we have a plan for October mm. and December. Yeah. The later ones, formaldehyde yeah, release no. and things, we don't know what the UK position is going to be. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're completely in the dark at the moment about whether the UK is going to follow that scientific approach and effectively copy the EU or implement it after or just not do it at all. But you're so finding most people are preparing <laughs> as if it will happen. Yeah, well, it's very difficult for companies that sell across the EU and the UK to have one product compliant in the EU and one compliant in the UK. So mo most larger companies just follow both. But I think it does help probably smaller brands in the UK can be more agile in that they won't have to follow the EU bans if they're UK centric. So that might be a reason for them to go down that route, yeah. but it's something to be aware of that you might have a different pressure in the EU against the UK. Um, but most people can't formulate for just one. The UK is not a big enough market to formulate specifically for it, yeah. is what yeah, we see. Really. And I think also from a PR perspective, it could be very difficult from company to argue the fact that I'm using something that is banned in Europe, yeah. but still <laughs> distributing in the UK. So whether or not yeah, we feel the ban was, I would say, justified, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it can be difficult. No, I, yeah, I completely agree. Um, so, so let's move on to uh, the EU chemical strategy for sustainability. Uh, the consultation period uh, for that finished relatively recently. Um, so what are the findings from that? What seem to be the main concerns among the industry and public? And what will happen next as, as regards the, um, that strategy? So, as you know, I think we talk a little bit about the divergence uh, happening with some of mm. the ingredients. I think the biggest divergence we're going to see is the new thinking about the EU Commission when it's come to uh, regulating cosmetic and not cosmetic as a sector, but as a chemical as a whole. Mm. From a regulator point of view, it makes sense. You want to align all of the legislation, having an horizontal legislation and the less sector specific regulation. Uh, so uh, there has been that thing coming for a while, which is why cosmetics are exempted from the classification, labeling and packaging legislation. Should it not be, I would say, regulated the same way? Uh, other chemical products are regulated. So they are looking into this option, uh, mainly I would say in terms also of the safety aspect of it, so to have all of this safety assessment being done under the CLP, which will be very interesting because as you can imagine, the use of a detergent product versus the use of a cosmetic is very different, so the safety should not be the, the same way, but uh, I would say that they are not yet sure about they're going to do things. At least there is still a lot of consulting aspect coming from the industry, trying to show whether or not this new system will work for cosmetic, but we will have definitely to implement more and more uh, aspect from the CLP. And uh, one discussion in particular that we are aware and we are a little bit more worried is about is um, talking about the link also with the environmental aspect because the chemical sustainable strategy is coming from the EU Green Deal. So not only on a safety point of view, and there is this big discussion about essential chemical. So it's not just about safety, it's also whether or not your chemicals are essential or are we putting things on the market that are not essential? And as we know, the cosmetic industry, they haven't been seen that much as essential in the past, more like a frivolous industry. So we need to get more guidance on that part about mm. how much is going to affect us. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. I think the cosmetics has benefited from having its own regulatory structure, a really engaged industry that's proven that the products are safe. It's allowed them to kind of, we've, we've been able to get on with with doing that process. Mm -hmm. um, being grouped in as a 
general chemical is really difficult and I think the desire has been from industry to retain the specific cosmetic assessment rather than being looped in as a general chemical assessment um, I don't think that's going to happen but I which is a real shame because I think the cosmetic product safety report is kind of the gold standard of an individual product safety report um, but I think we will lose that um, and I think that's just the way the industry is going so we, we have to be prepared for that but I don't see the UK going down that route so we will almost certainly end up with a safety assessment for the UK that matches the CPSR format now and a new format for the EU which will be a completely different change yeah mm. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry to lump us in with uh, chemicals generally further, uh, but regarding reach, um, what what issues uh, there, what changes um, are there that are impacting the beauty industry and its suppliers? Uh, and when I say reach, I mean this can either be obviously the original EU version or the uh, the newer UK reach. Yeah, so uh, on the on the reach is interesting, as you said, Julia, because um, it's been there since 20, uh, 2007, so it's a very old regulation in Europe. So we are getting used to the European regulation. The supply chain has been uh, organized for that. So the latest deadline was 2018. People are registering their substances. So REACH is, is keeping, I would say, its journey to make sure that uh, uh, substance used in Europe are safe from an environmental point of view or safety point of view from the workers. The issue we are facing since Brexit, of course, is the UK rich version, uh, which uh, me meant that we may end up with re-registering all of the substance. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, the company based in the UK were distributor before and end up now being importer in the UK. So they we have the one that need to register in the UK. The main issue that, and this is why there has been a lot of extension at the moment, uh, there was a notification that people could do that give them a little bit more time. So a lot of them have done it. But the main issue we are seeing is that REACH is not just a science legislation. There is a lot of money involved. So the biggest issue is not getting the data, is how much you're going to pay for the data. And when are we will be able to use the dossier that was submitted in Europe to uh, submit the same dossier in the UK because it has a lot of uh, intellectual property to it that needs to be bought. So this could mean that it will be more expensive. It is more expensive anyway for the, for the UK cosmetic industry. And it is also possible that we're going to lose substances if not everyone is interested in that. So I would say on the EU reach, I'm not too worried because I think we are getting there in the, in the understanding. But in the UK, when there was a lot of small distributor, mm -hmm. being able to uh, approach such a difficult re uh, regulation uh, is going to be uh, very, very difficult. So I would say there is nothing I can advise at the moment except start to get your data. Know what mm -hmm. is your tonnage. How much do you import? Can you give the responsibility to someone else? Are you buying from, I don't know, BASF? They may have registered the, the substance. So really try to do your internal homework when it's come to the data. So when the UK is very strict about it, you are all ready to, to do that. And uh, Sarah, is that your observation and experience as well? Absolutely. So I think, uh, as we were saying before, you know, it, there was an ideal situation where it used to be very discreet that the mechanism of the cosmetic sector was very obvious. But now I think across product safety regulations generally, we are seeing this convergence and divergence at the same time, which is making it incredibly complex for the cosmetics sector to figure out which aspects and how you're going to comply with them across the EU and the UK. So. Certainly, it has uh, intensified and become more complex, um, and that's definitely the feedback that we're getting. Um, and I think as we move forward to more divergence with different types of regulations coming in, which we'll talk about later today with Brexit and the plastics packaging tax and other pieces of legislation, that's a trend that we'll definitely can continue to see um, and something that yeah, we will we'll need to be equipped for. Well, um, on the topic of uh, plastic, <coughs> plastic <laughs> packaging pact, um, now I'm aware that this is an ingredient-centric panel and a lot of you are here for this, but I feel like we'd be ignoring a massive uh, regulatory elephant in the room if I didn't ask about this, uh, like plastics and plastic reduction laws in both uh, the EU and the UK. So, you know, where do these stand at the moment? You know, what's likely to be bought in in future as well, Sarah? So, I mean, the concept of... Um, 
environmental impact, as we've heard before, has really been embedded in cosmetics legislation and chemicals legislation for some time. So we all know really at the heart of reach, and admittedly it is also profit, but at the heart of reach is a lot of environmental um, considerations. And what we're seeing across sectors in product safety and product regulations generally is this leaning into ESG type obligations. So in the cosmetics industry, I think we always have been somewhat more impacted by these types of developments. And that remains the case with this new wave of ESG type obligations. I'd say if we look at it, um, Julia, in the rounds, there's probably three different areas in which we're seeing a proliferation of, of very specific legislation that isn't necessarily cosmetics legislation, but really does apply to the cosmetics industry in particular. So the first is, as we talked about, plastics and plastics tax. So the UK is a very unique, well, is a unique jurisdiction currently in so much as it has this tax in place and it came into fruition and applied from April this year. And what the tax is essentially doing is actually applying a tax on companies that use um, plastics, in, including in many of the industries in which we work if you do not have a cer certain um, recycled content for your product, so that the threshold is 30%. And as to who this legislation applies to, it's incredibly broad. It can be manufacturers, it can be um, packaging suppliers. In some instances, it can be consumers. So it has a really far reach. Mm. And there's different aspects to the tax too. I mean, first of all, you need to decide if your product is captured by the, the tax itself. And uh, as a product lawyer, I can say that already is quite a complex assessment, as many of you can attest to when looking about whether a piece of legislation applies to your particular product. The second aspect is outside of the actual tax itself, there'll be a, a registration requirement for many people who actually don't have to pay the tax. So MHRC will become involved in the UK. And clearly when we're talking about tax authorities, that makes people quite nervous quite rightly because <laughs> there, are some, there are some negative negative consequences if you don't get that right. And then of course there's the actual paying of the tax which can be quite a significant aspect of, of the product that you're making. And as I said, it may capture you in very unexpected ways. For example, if you're a, a manufacturer who wants to buy a packaging from a different country and you happen to import it into the UK, you may find yourself subject to the tax. So it is um, something that will proliferate throughout the rest of Europe, I would say. So the UK in this instance is leading the charge, but Spain and Italy have foreshadowed very similar pieces of legislation, as have a number of different European jurisdictions that have um, made reference to being keen to, um, to deal with this type of tax in this way. So I would say that's the first aspect, which is disincentivizing the use of certain types of products or certain type of ingredients, which are plastics in this instance. Um, also, the single-use plastics mm -hmm. um, rules that you would all be aware of did have some impact um, for the cosmetics industry as well. Again, another piece of legislation that is disincentivizing the use of certain types of in well products or ingredients of plastics to make sure that that isn't um, there in the future. But we obviously already have quite a lot of these products in circulation, so there's another mechanism that's in play, which is looking at the the circular economy or looking at how we get rid of these products that are already in the supply chain. And that's where we have a focus on the actual recyclability of products um, at the end of their life. So as you would all be aware, again, the cosmetics industry led the charge and had this extended producer responsibility in many instances when it comes to disposing of safely or recycling products at the end of their life cycle. Now we see the Waste Framework Directive, which is an EU-based piece of legislation that already was implemented pre-Brexit, so it also exists in the UK, which is leading even more into this concept of making sure that waste is disposed of in an appropriate way, including in particular plastics. So that's another aspect of making mm. sure that once something's in the supply chain, that it actually does, um, does do what it says. So we are seeing quite a lot of focus on that, and I suspect as we move forward into the other pieces of environmental legislation, there'll be an increased focus on, on looking at mm -hmm. um, certain types of products. I mean, even if we look at the SCCS's um, recent opinions, we can see that they're looking across sectors more, and they're looking at the exposure of certain chemicals in a way that we haven't before. So I suspect we'll more and more see, including in the plastic space, a borrowing of different types of regimes into the cosmetics world. Uh, we've seen the food contact materials has been mm. borrowed from, um, and many of those industries have very, very high thresholds for recyclability, ESG type obligations, 
whether that's take back requirements, whether that's some sort of design function to make sure a product doesn't have those um, aspects in them from the beginning, or whether it's actually taxing you or prohibiting you from using certain substances already or ingredients already. So it's a very dynamic and quite um, complex framework to work in. Absolutely. Um, so we've skirted around, flirted with the issue um, of, of divergence, um, but I'm now going to take us fully into the big ticket topic, which is Brexit. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of people here in the audience today uh, maybe are grappling uh, with some of the upshots still. So focusing specifically on the UK cosmetics regulation, you know, what, what are, I mean, anecdotally from your clients, from your experience as well, what are the pain points and or issues here uh, that people are having to face? Uh, maybe Alex, I can draw you into this one. Uh, yeah, so probably the biggest thing that everyone was gearing up for was the change in the labelling requirements. Um, the end of this year, everyone moving towards adding the UK responsible person in addition to their EU responsible person. Um, and the UK government just issued a three-year extension completely out of the blue. So I try and be as abreast of these things as I can. I try and sit on as many kind of boring groups as possible to <laughs> get as much information as possible and had no word of this change at all. Um, all of a sudden it's announced that we're, we're actually pushing the deadline all the way to the end of 2025, um, which is great if you haven't already made the change but if you've been anywhere near responsible, you probably have made the change already at some point in the last two years. Um, and so you probably don't benefit from that, which isn't great. I think the, the thing, the worrying thing is it just shows how quickly the UK can implement enormous changes like that because we're not tied to requiring 27 member states to agree the UK at a government level can just make changes and they can just issue those changes and they can issue guidance in. So the way that works is they issue a guidance document that effectively says, we promise the legislation will be updated. Now, the issue with this update was until the legislation is updated, it can actually, that promise can be revoked. So the guidance is ahead of the legislative change. Um, now, in this case, this, this is okay, but it's one of the things that concerns me is how quickly these items can change. Um, I suppose the big pain point that everyone dealing with the UK regulation is dealing with is probably the portal, so the UK SCPN. Um, I don't know if anyone's been on the portal in the last week or so, but there's been a pretty substantive change to the way you notify products with exact formulations or with range formulations. So instead of allowing us to do the really easy thing of uploading a formula in a PDF, you now have to upload it ingredient by ingredient, and it's very, very painstaking. Um, the way the portal is structured is like any of the UK government um, systems. So it's like when you do your car tax, it's all based around can every single person in the UK use this system with no training? That's the goal of the, the system. But they're not very good at making industry specific things where all the users are experts and don't need their hands holding. So what it means is there's a million button clicks to go through each thing. You can't do multiple things at once. So each ingredient is done one by one. Um, and the concern with that change was that OPSS actually have been really good with industry in terms of developing the portal. So we've had testing of all major changes. They involved industry right at the beginning of the development phase. Um, and although it was by no means perfect, at least they understood the things industry were looking for um, and have worked to implement them. Um, this change, I believe from talking to people close to it, actually came from a minister or from someone involved in OPSS who decided that they needed more formulation information that they could gather from the portal. So I think they were concerned that they couldn't interrogate the formulations in the portal because they were PDF documents this way will allow them to go into their database and say, okay, how many products contain phenoxyethanol at 0.8%? And they will be able to gather that information. And so this change was implemented with no industry discussion and it hasn't been up for discussion. They, they have effectively said, it doesn't really matter what your feedback is because this is the change. So kind of get used to it. I think that's very unusual compared to, to the EU system, right? 
Yes, so the the EU system, the the CPMP has had its very significant pain points, but I think because we've been using it for so many years, it it's we're, we're used to using it, and it, it does allow us to work in ways that are, are kind of more robust. Um, the UK SCPN is very frustrating to use, um, and it's actually moving out. So we're in kind of the last stage of development. So at the moment, they are working on some key features which industry have asked for so being able to search for products which we've never been able to do um being able to mark products as no longer manufactured or archive them which we currently can't do um so those kind of things are being done but that will spell an end to the development of the system so effectively you've got what you've got after that point and they'll just be maintaining it so making sure it it runs but they won't be doing any major change um i guess that's because the investment in those systems is coming to an end um so Unfortunately, I think that's going to be kind of the way it is, but that's probably the most significant pain point because as it is at the moment, the UK regulation is just the European regulation. Um, I suspect we will see less regulation in the UK compared to the EU and will be at least slower in implementing change um, from an ingredient point of view. Cause I just don't think there's the desire. And they've only just finished setting up the scientific committee for looking at ingredients. So, um, and we're yet to really get a steer of what those people are, what what their goal is going to be, what are they looking to restrict. So, so what will the upshot of that be for uh, companies selling into both markets then? Almost everyone will just follow the EU regulation and sell those products in the UK, I think. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. And, um, and Olivia and Sarah, I mean, have uh, you noticed any things uh, with regards to either the cosmetics regulation in the UK, uh, as, as Alex has been uh, describing, or beyond that regulation? You know, what are the other legislative impacts uh, of Brexit that are affecting cosmetics players, uh, positively or negatively, either way? Mm-hmm. I think, uh, as, as Alex said, study the, the notification. From us, I would just say, whereas before the UK was not that high on inspection, on product information file, or on safety assessment, uh, uh, it started this July. We had a lot of customers being stopped at border, asking to see the product information file, or even companies that are part of some program with OPSS asking to see a product information file. So uh, I will just reply on that part to say, well, we are seeing now an enforcement, which is good because they want to make sure that products are safe. But uh, yeah, it could be like uh, send me electronically the product information file, which you know you, you should keep your own dossier in house. So I think it's a discussion with the authority, but yeah, we are, whereas in Europe we saw the inspection very quickly uh, of product being stopped at the custom if they didn't have the address. In the UK, I would say it started this summer and is getting increasing. So we have more and more customers contacting us for a request of inspection. Mm. Yeah, and I completely echo those sentiments. I mean, again, um, often as a lawyer, our job is to interface with the regulators, whether that's a proactive reach out to help you build your relationship or it's unfortunately reactive if there's been some sort of issue. And I would say that um, in the UK, we don't appreciate um, the, the many layers we have potentially applicable to cosmetic products. So across the EU, there really isn't a EU wide um, product safety regulator. And often the general regulator in each member state will act as the cosmetics regulator. Here in the UK, we have obviously trading standards who are the day-to-day enforcers, but we, we also have this super body, the OPSS, that was um, uh, formed many years ago now, but is actually a unique feature of the UK system that adds an layer of, a layer of regulation. On top of that, we now have the Competition Markets Authority who are getting more and more involved in topics like greenwashing or green claims or anything to do with that aspect, as well as the advertising um, authorities. So we really don't appreciate if we're sitting here as um, UK uh, that we do have a lot more layers of regulation, which, um, as I said before, and as Olivia echoed just then, it's the fact that we are no longer part of the EU means that these regulators do and ha- and will enforce um, the powers that they, they have under their UK specific legislation and therefore products that are on the market will be more scrutinised. And I think alongside that is also this concept that we've been sort of talking about for some time is, you know, dual compliance, having to do everything twice and slightly differently sounds like an easy thing to do. But as we've heard from all of our answers, that (laughs) definitely isn't the case. And I think from a legal perspective, it's quite important to remember that 
um, the borders, literally speaking, are quite loose between the EU and the UK still. But as a as a legal entity and as someone responsible for the movement of those goods, that doesn't mean the regulators won't be expecting you to take proactive steps to ensure that your products that are meant for a, a certain market, either the UK or the EU, if they're not compliant in the other market, that they are not making their way there. So sometimes, for example, e-commerce is, is a really big one where it's easy for, for um, customers to purchase products that are meant for a different market and, and purchase them in their own home country. Uh, regulators are increasingly stepping up their attempts to look at online marketplaces generally, but also to make sure that manufacturers or people selling these products are actually taking steps to, for example, geo-block or take additional requirements such as taking addresses and making sure that where they are supplying these products are actually the markets for which they intended to be compliant in. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is that, you know, working with regulators is actually quite a hard job that they're having to do at this point in time because, um, you know, we have a lot of change. We have copy and pasted legislation um, that doesn't necessarily think a lot about the practicalities behind it. So often we're hearing from regulators who are trying to, to do the best they can and are often very, um, uh, you know, cognizant of these issues are having to work with what is quite a rigid black and white legal system that is actually meant often for different circumstances and in different times with the absence of any guidance to help us and them to navigate this grey area. Yeah, I think we've seen, we're still seeing a lot of blurred lines between the EU and the UK. I think it was always going to happen, Brexit was a really messy thing to, to move through. Um, so even the legislators still refer to EU bits of documentation they we regularly get requests for eu cpmp numbers through various bodies through retailers or people in the uk vice versa portugal on the portuguese forms now they want proof of the uk notification i've got no idea why they could possibly <laughs> want that but they do um probably just portugal <laughs> yeah probably something some, some of you can resonate with the fact that you can't generate a pdf from the uk portal is very frustrating when you want to be able to provide proof of the notification so you have to screenshot the notification which is really really frustrating um, and we, we are seeing those blurred lines because the UK hasn't replicated all the guidance and all the the background so all of that is still EU documentation um, and then there are some kind of unique things that we've done so the UKCA mark has been quite messy in that they they decided to loop in aerosols in a way that differs from the way they're looped in 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 the um in the eu so they've had to issue a huge amount of clarity on that because this copy and paste exercise didn't work perfectly so we've now got this like very significant divergence between the ce mark What's and the uk ca mark work perfectly um, There's no particular reason behind that. yeah i think they just decided to group it in <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't really understand why um I, I, it was something to do with the way they changed the aerosol legislation and the ce mark and the the two didn't then marry up um so I think it's going to take a, f a long time to unpick all of those kind of different bits where we have the, um, the crossover. It's uh, certainly very complex. Uh, I, I can see that we have a packed uh, room here, which is fantastic. Uh, and I can only assume that you have lots of exciting questions for our panel. Uh, so uh, would anyone like to be brave and be the first to go ahead and uh, ask a question? Or is everything absolutely rosy with everyone? No one's having any problems? Anyone had to grapple with the new portal? No. No? Oh, Just ah. me. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. A pretty open question. Um, do you think there's any chance in the future of some harmonisation back again between the UK and EU regulatory systems once we've had enough suffering? <laughs> <laughs> um, from my point of view I think that would spell a real change in UK government direction um, at the moment all the talk is about deregulation and harmonising with the EU is the opposite of deregulation the, the whole purpose of Brexit the whole selling point of Brexit was being able to deregulate in these specific areas and actually that's the opposite of what we're seeing You know, we had Jacob Rees-Mogg on the television talking about deregulation while his own department was implementing a very frustrating way of using the portal which loses us all time so those two things don't always kind of go down the chain but I think it would it would almost certainly take an entire change of government to do that 
but under a under a new government, under a Labour government potentially, we might see see that. I suppose that depends as well on how the EU see that, how they would feel about allowing us to kind of do that. We could see it more informally where the legislators here go, okay, our primary goal is just to piggyback off the EU legislation, which is what we see in other countries. And they there doesn't seem to be any problem with that. They basically just go, if the EU bans something, you can assume it's going to be banned here. And we might see that as a way of kind of staying harmonised. But I think official harmonisation is unlikely. And as you said, the, the EU side is always to looked at because the CPNP were not able to be part of it because yep. it was uh, the Brexit. Rich data is the same. Now the EU is working on environmental <coughs> EU green deal with maybe potentially a product passport labelling. Again, it will have a specific system. So unfortunately, we are a bit excluded. So even if they want to do something similar, they will have to create their own system. So how far do we want to be harmonized in this situation? No? Yeah, yeah I, I think it depends what we, how we view harmonization too. I think if we're talking about general themes of development, I still think even outside of the cosmetics uh, sector specific approach, but if we're looking at, for example, product liability directive and the general product safety regulations, which have both been proposed to be significantly amended at the EU level, um, all along the lines of AI technology, e-commerce and um, cyber security essentially, so modernising our regimes for, for new products. That I think is a theme that will have to be echoed across the UK as well as uh, the rest of the world frankly. Um, for the very reason that we are producing more innovative products that have these features that you know, there's obviously a debate about whether we need hard law, like new legislation, to keep up with these technological advancements, or whether, in fact, what we have, which, for example, the product liability regime has been in existence since 1985, whether we really need to change that because technological change has been so more significant since then than we've seen in the last five years. But those types of general themes about balancing innovation with safety and um, sort of making sure that we have a nimble system to allow, to not stifle innovation must, I think, have to be retained across, across both um, markets and certainly has been to date. But the other thing is, I guess it allows an opportunity for both markets to cherry pick what they consider to be the best aspects for their particular market. Um, you know, what the UK does may not be appropriate for whatever reason for the EU because of their economic incentives or the way that they run business or the goals of, the, of whatever it is that whoever is in charge considers to be at the time. Um, but certainly there are some benefits to having uh, a slightly out of sync system because there are ability for people to see the practical implementation of those regimes ahead of time. So it's not all doom and gloom. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was yeah. going to say, based on that, that point, to kind of play devil's advocate and uh, or maybe Jacob rees Boggs advocate <laughs> here in this instance, I mean, have there been benefits that you've seen to this, um, you know, this deregulation aspect of Brexit I mean, in this industry? It's a big benefit having the UK being able to make make changes like the like the transition period for artwork. Obviously, someone looked at that and through canvassing opinion, they went, actually, the the industry isn't going to be in compliance with that. This is what we were seeing, that the industry as a whole was not going to be in compliance with that deadline at the end of this year. I'm sure I, uh, most of you probably work for very large companies and all the large companies were going to be in compliance because you were prepared for it. But what I was seeing as a person who works with a lot of SMEs and smaller companies, a lot of them weren't going to be ready. It was very difficult for them to understand the fact that this was effectively for them a cliff edge because they hadn't considered sell-through periods so they're bringing products out the middle of this year and then going oh actually we're not going to have sold all those products by the end of this year so what do i do then and the answer was well you throw them in the bin basically or you sell them somewhere else um so that is a good thing that they can look at the industry and go rather than allow everyone to go out of compliance and then look to punish people will actually change the rules to allow people longer to do that and that adaptation is helpful mm. and I think OPSS have been much more open with their communication than the European Commission are That's good. they're That's much good. more involved and they're they're much better at dealing with us pr primarily through the work of the CTPA is where you see that the most um, which is good because the industry can have a direct involvement there um, so that is easier um, so I'm sure there will be benefits. I suppose that the big problem we've got with harmonization and with change is the Northern Ireland question is the one mm. that always holds up both ways. 
we, it's very hard to fully diverge yourself to say, right, we're going to be a really low regulatory environment because we've got the Northern Ireland problem and it, it's equally problematic the other way. So um, that's always kind of the sticking point when they're looking at changes is how do they handle Northern Ireland and products sold into Northern Ireland and then into the UK or from the UK into Northern Ireland and then into Europe. All right, any more? Oh, hang on. Uh, Amanda, if we could pass this to this gentleman. <coughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, Chris Brennan at Discernis. Uh, I've got a question for all three of you, uh, and it's about claims. Uh, I guess you being the lawyer, RP, <laughs> and the regulatory consultancy, Olivia. Um, what claims would you say would be gathering the most attention from trading standards and competent authorities in the <coughs> EU? From a, from our perspective, I would say uh, we think, um, from a training center point of view, they are more looking at is there a PIF first, we have to be honest. And when they go further in, the, in dipping in the, in the document uh, on the claim, not all of them will go up to that, you see. But we know that because since there was a CMA green code, they are starting to be a little bit more, I would say, interested in green claims. So they have to do it as a priority approach. As we know, green claims are very difficult because it needs a lot of substantiation and the claims can be very qualified. So what we understand is that they are first of all focusing on absolute claim. So this is an easy win for them. So eco-friendly, uh, benefit for the environment, green product, uh, when it's very difficult for substantiate and they have an easy win. But again, I would say the claims uh, aspect, we're seeing less from the trading standard, we're seeing more from the ISA and Clearcast. Yeah. This is my view, yeah. Yeah, I agree. In all our discussions with OPSS and training standards, they've not asked about claims once as part of their check. They're looking at technical compliance, not mm -hmm not these kind of what they consider gray areas because they're probably not they don't have the experts on hand to deal with those questions um anti-pollution and those kind of claims are the big ones for me that are under a lot of scrutiny um blue light protection all of those things they, they there's a big move against those claims or a cracking down on how you kind of substantiate them yeah i guess from my perspective i mean it makes sense that um the OPSS and uh, the product safety regulators defer this question because it really is an advertising question that they're happy to pass off to their ASA colleagues in this context. And the Advertising Standards Agency is really keen on this topic. Um, again, the ESG types of claims, so anything to do with recyclability, anything to do with um, looking at the full life cycle of the product, because that's one thing that has been very focused upon is it's fine and good to say that your product does X, Y, and Z or it saves, you know, X amount of carbon emissions, but if that's not true for the full life cycle of your product, that's not a proper claim that you should be making. So that circularity of a product life cycle in terms of ESG claims is something that has um, definitely been focused upon more. Efficacy or substantiation is a bedrock, as um, Olivia was saying, in terms of, of product claims themselves. Um, and also the, the Competition Markets Authority has made moves to move into this area as well and sort of, especially in the greenwashing space, mm. as they've produced mm. a greenwashing um, Good, or yes. green claims code, which suggests to me that um, that would be an area of particular focus, not least of which because there's two regulators in the same space looking at the same topic. Um, and I think, again, we have to be cognizant of the fact that already the cosmetics industry is, again, at the forefront of, of managing free from claims or organic claims or any type of claim, because unlike other types of products, it has a regulation um, or an aspect of regulation within the framework itself. And therefore, it, it starts with the regulation and then it moves to these, these other types of secondary pieces of legislation about advertising generally, which is where the advertising standards um, come in. Um, but because of that, cosmetics will always necessarily, I think, be more focused upon than probably many other types of products in the market for the same types of claims that you might see, including in respect of green claims. Yeah. Great, thanks. Hmm. Any, any other questions from the audience? No, well, well in that case, um, I mean, thank you for asking, sir, because you've sort of um, Jump, jumped into uh, the, the next question, which was really going to be on, um, you know, claims and marketing. But, um, I mean, are there any other recent or upcoming regulatory changes that uh, the audience should be aware of, um, possibly in marketing, possibly beyond that, uh, that we haven't yet discussed? 
Um, sorry, oh, go on. No, sir. go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, I suppose the big one is the fragrance allergens mm -hmm. in the European Union. So the plan to increase the number of required fragrance allergens. Um, I don't believe there's a date for that yet. Is there, Olivia? I think it's going to be a, a good few years away, but it, it oh, certainly okay. appears to be happening. Um, that That's a massive change in that it's not only a big change for labelling, and I think in the latest draft there's no discussion on digitalising that information, so at the moment our understanding is that's just going to go on the inky list like all the other 26 allergens. Um, the, the issue is about documentation for me, so at the moment those allergens aren't included on your allergen declaration that you might get from your fragrance supplier, they're not part of the testing that's carried out, so all of that regime needs time to change and needs to be updated. Um, and then the labeling needs to be updated to include those. The, the implementation of that is going to be very, very difficult. Because um, as with all things, spotting non-compliance is very difficult. Because what you're saying there is, if you don't have to declare them, you don't have to declare it. Mm. So it's not obvious if you're not doing it because you don't have to do it, or you're not doing it because you've not followed the legislation. And with all those things, it's very, very difficult for the legislator outside of testing for... 60 plus allergens they're not going to be able to prove non-compliance mm -hmm. um, and what we see is that you it's much easier for them you're much more likely to get caught for something that they can just look at the products and know you're not doing so yeah. this is like the rp thing if you don't put your rp on the label that someone's always going to spot it because mm -hmm. it's really obvious but if you've missed off an allergen that you should have declared under the, the new regime then who's going to know unless they specifically go and look for it so mm -hmm. That's going to be really interesting to see where the level of compliance falls for that because some people will do it, but I suspect some people will just choose not to and hope that they don't get caught. Yeah, an realistically, kind of right? it becomes that because you're, you're very, very, very unlikely one to get chosen or to get subject to a test anyway, and then for them to actually go to the point of testing it. And if they catch you, what's the consequence? In all likelihood, you just go, Oh, sorry, I'm going to update the label. So it becomes it becomes a very difficult thing to enforce. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, I can see you're about to... Uh... Yeah, <laughs> I, I would say, I mean, it's, it's the themes I touched upon, but I would say that there's some broader legislative changes that are really incredibly significant in product safety and product liability generally. I mean, we haven't seen changes like this in 30 years. Um, in the legislature's infinite wisdom, they decided to review and try and amend every mainstay piece of product safety and product liability legislation at the same time, um, which now they have proposed amendments for the mainstay piece of product safety and product liability legislation in the EU. So as I mentioned, they're along the lines of AI, um, cyber security, and basically broadening the concept of what is a defective product, which basically translates to you potentially having a lot more claims um, about product liability claims about your products at the end of the day. That matched with the um, new class actions regime, which is much more similar to what we see in the US. So cross-border across Europe, we will have the collective redress regime, which is an EU-based piece of legislation, which will mean that consumers are able to use this piece of legislation to bring class actions more akin to what you're used to seeing in the States. That specifically applies to product safety and product liability issues. That's written in the legislation itself. So. I think we can expect to see a proliferation of those types of issues as we move towards the implementation of that class action regime across Europe. Um, there's a continued focus on distance selling or e-commerce platforms. We saw the Omnibus Directive, which is um, requiring us, as we all know, to have an EU-based responsible person yeah. if we're a foreign manufacturer that doesn't have an entity based in the EU. That type of regulation on e-commerce selling and distance selling, as I said, will definitely continue to be a theme. Um, so really uh, we need to, and also just the change of the general product safety regime as well that again includes cyber security concepts and again broadening the definition of what is a safe product from the front end rather than just from a liability perspective um, basically translates to a much more litigious environment and a much more tricky environment in terms of general regulatory compliance and enforcement from authorities. So. Um, an interesting time, but a, a fairly complex one. Mm. Yeah, it that's sounds like that's yeah. going to be a real shift change there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is, is it possible we see then the kind of straw man plaintiff groups in the EU that we see in the US all the yeah. time? People who have firms specifically to identify potential non-compliance and then attempt to get settlements. Yeah. Absolutely. So we see it in different industries already. It's claims farming where you have 
entire organizations that set up just for this purpose yeah. for yeah. one particular issue so i think for cosmetics pfas is a really good example of probably where we're going to see mm -hmm. the litigation stem from i must say that in terms of the collective redress regime in the eu there are many more qualifications as to what entities can bring these class actions it needs to be a qualified representative um, so they do have to jump right. through some hoops, but mm. frankly, that's almost every claimant, pro-claimant or industry group. So um, whilst there's a little bit of a threshold, it still means that there's going to be a lot of room for claimant law firms. So as a defendant or firm, I'm <laughs> looking yeah. forward to the creative ways in which they may come up to, um, to, to figure out, as you say, how to bring claims <laughs> against, yeah. against manufacturers and, and product suppliers generally. Um, the, the one area I was hoping to see progress in, which we haven't, is the um, the digitalisation of labelling yeah. in mm. both mm. Um, the UK and the EU, and it's been on the on the docket for discussion many times. And yeah. but unfortunately, the thing that always stops it is they go, "We like the idea, but not for legally required information." Yeah, which is, is which is the whole point. The consumer themselves won't comply for, for looking up that information. Yeah, so that that's the, the 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 thing that stops it is they don't want people who don't have access to smartphones for economic reasons or because they they don't want to use them. My um, father. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like so, older people tend to have less access to that kind of technology, and they don't want them to miss out on uh, legally required safety information because of this change. But that's that stops the change completely because you could put digitalization for your non-required information on your labels anyway. So you don't need the regulation to tell you you can put a QR code for your marketing information because you can do that now. So it's a shame that we're not really able to make progress in that direction. But until until you can replace information on the label, then it doesn't save you any space. And therefore, the change is, is effectively pointless because you can duplicate the information as many times as you like. Um, but that will continue to be one of those things that rolls around and eventually they will get to the point where the pickup of that kind of smart technology will be so large that they'll go actually it's Seriously. worth making the change um i did think that the fr it was it was in the one of the early discussions about the fragrance allergens mm -hmm. one of the things they talked about was you have to declare the allergen but you can only do it you can do it digitally but that got scrapped from the draft which would have been a really nice way of making progress um but unfortunately they don't seem they seem very reluctant to make that change at the moment they, they will have to and i was hoping that at least for the address uh, instead yeah. of extending they will accept a digital aspect mm -hmm. but uh, i think uh, if we looked at that now uh, even as you see on the fragrance allergen on other topic we have all these member states coming with recycling or sorting information like the tree man in france this is a big issue spain yeah. also acquiring new uh, labeling information and uh, well with what is going to be a book letter packaging you see at one stage they will have to come up with uh, with a digital option huh? yeah mm -hmm. and w we're seeing now the thing where they go well we've got our own recycling so we don't <laughs> like we don't like the other so we don't like the green dot or we don't but you they can't do that because they mm -hmm. can't push us down the thing of having one pack for each country that's not sustainable um i digitalization would be ideal for recycling where you say this is the product and this mm -hmm. is where i'm trying to recycle it what where can i recycle it that would be the ideal solution but it doesn't seem to be the way we're going unfortunately guys uh we only have a few minutes left so the final question which was what will be the most impactful area of legislation for the cosmetics industry in 2023 and 2024 could i ask for a one sentence answer as a roundup and then if anyone does want um to to go into more depth um to, to maybe come up and speak to our panelists and to uh, continue the conversation in room a uh, so yes um olivia what do you think will be the, the most important thing for me it will be the eu green deal Mm -hmm. So everything that encompasses that, huh? Yeah, I think for me it will be what position the UK decides to take on ingredient changes. Mm -hmm. And for okay. me it's the broadening scope of what is a safe or what is a defective product based mm -hmm. on ESG and or technolo mm -hmm. technological advancements. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much, Alex, mm -hmm. Olivia and Sarah, for your regulatory insights there. Um, it's obviously a dense and complex topic, but I think you made it uh, really accessible and interesting for everyone here. Uh, so a huge thank you.